I'm just going to introduce our moderator and then we're going to get started with the event. Uh, I want to introduce to everybody Matthew Gardner, the Head of Advisory Life Sciences for the Americas for CBRE. Matthew has over 30 years of experience in advising people in making the right choices for their life sciences sector needs in hubs and emerging markets for real estate needs in the life sciences. Um, he's also the CEO and co-founder of CBRE um, and the, the, the California Biomanufacturing Center. All right, I'm going to let Matthew take it away. Our panel is in excellent hands. All right, let's see, how's that going? Okay, you thought you could hide me back, but I'm going to wreck that for you. So I'm just going to make a couple of scene setting comments before I turn over to each of the panelists to introduce themselves. How many of you have worked in a top 50 pharma company? Okay. All right. And how many of you have worked in a startup biotech, including the current? Okay, that's excellent. Okay. No? Sort of? Okay. We'll take that. We'll count that. All right. So um, here's why I think it's just important to remind everybody, in, in case you take for granted, What's happening in Philadelphia? So for decades, this was a pharma town. And if you're old enough to remember Smith Klein Beecham, how many of you are old enough to remember Smith Klein Beecham? <laughs> Smith Klein Beecham was out in the suburbs. Like many pharma owned and operated campuses, kind of working away out there. And if you were down here, you could have forgotten they were out there. One day, Glaxo comes along. They meet, there's immediate ro romance, they get together, and they get married in the year 2000. And it becomes GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. That leaves them with two campuses out in the suburbs. Same thing happened in Raleigh, in the Research Triangle, they had two campuses. Well, those kinds of marriages cause things to sometimes break apart or change. Change management is part of the life cycle in, in the industry. That kind of pharma presence in Philadelphia is what made this such a strong uh, industry driver for decades. But it's just not what you're known for today. And I'm sure many of you know, and have felt it, that the change has happened to cell and gene therapy. You're sort of ground zero of all that. And the world knows it. It's not a secret. When Roche can buy a company in downtown and keep it downtown and leave its name on the side of the building, if the Swiss know, everybody knows. So I think the secret's out. Uh, this is what makes uh, Philadelphia a secret sauce in the business. And the rest of the world is watching very closely. So for those of you who are sort of wondering what will happen next, I would say for those pharma companies that you see globally making cell and gene therapy bets that are not yet here yet, pretty good idea of what's to come. They'll end up here one way or another. Uh, so, I think that's the key differentiator for Philadelphia, and I think it, where we're sitting is a really fascinating microcosm of all that. If you're tracking the change, the sort of adaptive reuse of University City itself, just this is back of the cocktail, napkin math, this is not proven. In fact, if you want proof, I brought my data center guy, <laughs> the actual data center. His brain is a data center, his name is Ian Anderson, hi Ian. If you, if you want proof of anything I say, first of all, I don't. But Ian does know, so, and Ian happens to live here in Philly, so I'm sure he'll be happy to, to help. If you roughly look at University City from sort of 10,000 feet, it's kind of about halfway, right, to being renewed. And so there's still a long way to go, and a long way to go up for that renewal to take place. It's a tremendous opportunity. What are we feeling right now? Small cap end of the market hurts a little bit. Uh, it's a little, uh, there's kind of a pause. But if you've been in biotech long enough, if you knew what Smith Klein Beecham was, you know these cycles tend to go very briefly and that the industry's economic cycle doesn't quite match the general economic cycle, and it's because of the product development timelines. We'll come out of this, and the industry's pipeline's bigger than it's ever been before. So the progress is really based on the pipeline, not what the general economy's doing. So just just to start on sort of a level set picture for us, now I want to ask each of my colleagues to introduce themselves. And Daisy, we can start. All right, happy to get this started. 
Uh, so I started off my career as a bench scientist, actually um, as an undergraduate at Penn. I uh, contributed to a few publications, got the research bug, and then pursued a doctorate at MIT where I was studying breast cancer metastasis at the Koch Institute. Um, I moved to the Boston area um, right as the, uh, really the biotech industry was really exploding. And so I was, I was witnessing that um, all around me while I was uh, completing my graduate studies. Um, and really got bit by the entrepreneurial bug there as well. So I went into Magic Consulting for a couple of years before I joined Smart Labs. Um, currently I'm head of channel partnerships and I've been there for five years. Thank you, Daisy. Mark? My background is um, starting up companies in technology, media, and now biotech. I was the co-founder of Invax, which is an immunotherapy company uh, that spun out of Jefferson. It's now entering its fourth clinical trial uh, for glioblastoma and doing very well. I was brought here, I think, to represent the small potatoes part of the startup <laughs> world. Uh, we're currently located in the suburbs, not at University City. Um, so my background is uh, to, among other things, run a uh, diagnostics reference laboratory in uh, suburban Philadelphia that does distribute, if you will, uh, diagnostics IP nationally. Uh, I also have some unfortunate experience, I suppose, in the startup world, or frustrating experience, so I can empathize with anybody here who is thinking about how do I afford a lab and you know what the heck. Um, and I'll be talking about a project that I uh, got enamored of a couple of years back when we had a big space with uh, too much idle time due to COVID. So I am looking to find a way to host very early stage companies in particularly the diagnostics value chain. And I'll be talking about that today. Thanks, Eric. Well, let's actually uh, start with you on a first question. If you're sort of following a startup in chronological order from the idea, the first question I want to ask for each of us is, how do you start to conceive of the amount of space that you'll need at that real true seed stage? Well, first of all, I think that answer to that question might have really changed over the last couple of years as we've learned to truly adapt to more virtual work. But in the lab space, in the lab world, there aren't many options to do things virtually other than, and I think Art will be talking about the CRO option or DAISY as well. But um, I, I think that since this is kind of a real estate heavy group, we all know that the three things people think about are location, location, location. And I think that's relevant, you know, when you're trying to think about starting a business. Uh, but when you're the startup person, you have three other things in your head, which is the money, the money, the money, of which you have very little. Uh, time is your enemy, and your burn rate is a measure of how close your enemy is to killing you. So I think you really need to take a viewpoint of getting started in a laboratory space. If you're in one now and it's free, hang on to it as long as you can. If, you're, if it's not big enough, it's not adequate, or you're getting kicked out, then you need to rise to a challenge. You will not be able to get a lease, I don't think, very easily. I mean, if I, as a landlord, have somebody coming in and say, yeah, I have a, a grant from SBIR and I'm gonna sign a seven-year lease, I'll probably have a hard time with that. So mm -hmm. the options that we'll be talking about this evening, I think, speak to that need of what do I do between you know, buying my own, which you're not gonna do unless you, you know, have hit the lottery or something, or build your own. It's about three, 400 bucks a square foot, and that assumes you have a building. Uh, you're not gonna get a lease. So what we did, we sublet in California, a terrible place for real estate, but you know, that was my experience there. We were lucky that we were able to exploit the person who held the lease, because they had a whole lot of space that they couldn't get out of. Um, I shouldn't say that out loud, but that's the reality. Uh, so I'm an exploiter. Uh, and then what I think is the best answer is what I'm trying to do, what others here have tried to do, which is to provide something like an incubator space, which is a facility that gives you the laboratory that you need, and there's different versions of that, uh, with some support, and we'll be talking about what that looks like. Uh, but the fact of the matter is laboratory space is expensive to build, to maintain, to acquire. 
so if you're able to either keep what you have or you're able to find something that is reasonable that doesn't require you to make a long-term commitment, your investors will be much happier with you if you don't spend their money on space and rather spend it on the people that are going to make the space valuable. That's a great answer, and you set up a lot of follow-up questions, so we'll try and dive in as much as we can. We have a very short time. And just as one housekeeping note, I think we're all happy to take questions anytime they come up. So if you have a question, throw it out. We'll, we'll do our best to field as many as we can as we're going. Daisy, I'd love to come to you next and sort of ask you to pick up from Eric there on yeah, the I efficiencies that come from co-locating with others in the same space. Yeah, so I think what is important for a startup is to actually realize that the same path isn't going to be as effective for every single company. And so I think it is important to remember that we're all giving you advice. You're going to get advice from so many different sources. It's all contextual. You really have to realize what's going to apply to you and what won't. So when you're starting a new company, what do you have to prove? Like, what is it, like you want to develop a drug, but are you still in the discovery phase? Have you figured out your lead asset? Do you know, um, are you going with a small molecule? Are you going with an antibody to target something? Are you a platform with the company? You really have to define what you want to do, what you want to be and be focused in on that goal. You need to make sure that if you are still on SBIR, SBIR grants or um, don't really have a strong VC base yet because you haven't made that proof of concept, you have to focus your research on getting the evidence that, that will prove to these investors that you are the real thing, that you this is a real uh, technology that will deliver to patients. And so I think that part of what you have to really understand is like, what do you need to do? Do you need your own lab space to do these uh, experiments? Because this is brand new. No one's ever done it before, like, so you can't outsource it. Or do you actually choose to, I'm just going to send this to a CRO. They're going to do me the, my first uh, few studies. And then I'll be able to then pick a molecule and base uh, my fundraising on that. Um, and so we, I think it's important for you to, to talk to your advisors to really understand the strength of your science and um, get some early feedback from investors in terms of what you need to do for them to be excited about your project. So Art, I want to set up a sort of follow up to that just by saying I've done about a dozen startups, not all of them my own, but in one case I was employee number one of an angel-backed startup in Palo Alto, right on University Avenue. It's a life experience I recommend it to everybody. Mm -hmm. It's also terrifying and a white knuckle ride, right? <laughs> uh, pretty exciting stuff. I used to be dark <laughs> So I think it, it may have been kids though. Right? In that case, I had an investor who really didn't want us to generate a burn rate as much as we could limit it. So we were entirely virtual. I never hired anyone else except for contractors and basically mm -hmm. CROs and, and did work directly in hospitals with project managers. So Art, can you give a, a sort of a view of what a virtual biotech is and how possible it is to virtualize some of these pieces of the product development cycle? Biotech is actually an interesting industry and how I can speak about this from the perspective of being in in technology companies and media companies, and biotech is about the um, most efficient industry in outsourcing anything you can think of. There are people out there that will will handle your job, obviously for a fee. Um, our own experience at Invex was was outsourcing. Um, as much as we could, including outsourcing to Jefferson itself, uh, which worked great. Um, and um, geez, we, we have continued to do that. We ended up, however, because the um, technology and the um, clinical progress that we were making warranted it, we ended up building labs and um, a cell processing center about three blocks down at the Curtis Center, which is state of the art and, and uh, the first of its kind. Um, so, but before that, we, we everything from, heck, when I started the company, I was amazed at this. I found a, I needed an accounting assistant. I found this person in Bulgaria. And wow. um, she was fantastic, and she understood uh, biotechnology. Um, so we built from there. We did, outsourced HR. We outsourced, of course, legal. Um, uh, you can do pretty much anything in this industry, I think. 
So Daisy, we, we don't want you to give away all of the secrets of Smart Labs while you're here. <laughs> Maybe just a few. Mm -hmm. But obviously a great part of your secret sauce is sort of that hybrid between incubation of startups that need a lot of support, but also a bunch of shared resources in one place. So you're kind of doing all those things, plus being a little bit of a CRO, plus being a little bit of a CDMO. You've got all those kinds of ingredients. Can you talk a little bit about that? And Yeah. So Smart Labs has really been developed to cater to companies who are graduating out of incubators, um, large pharma organizations. Um, really, it's, it's, we're positioning ourselves to be the alternative to a traditional real estate option. So any company that would normally go out to build out their own space could do that, or they could save their cash and focus on building their team and their R&D strategy and come into a program like Smart Labs and really try out a few different strategies before they commit to something long term. One of the biggest challenges with biotech is the fact that it's very much a lottery. Everyone is trying so hard to develop a drug, but the majority of them will not succeed. And how much of a commitment do you want to make today for something that you haven't gotten proof of concept yet, or maybe you're just starting your animal uh, studies. Um, maybe it's something that if you can just get a little bit more evidence, you're confident what your five-year strategy will be. And so get that additional uh, bit of evidence. Come to a program like ours for one to five years. Like uh, uh, The concept really is that companies can grow within our facility over time. But then we actually have also focused a lot on co-localizing these um, very infrastructure intensive resources like at Vivarium and in manufacturing suites. Uh, again, the, the concept is you could outsource this or you could build it yourself or you could access our infrastructure and then maintain the people, the technology, uh, the process will be your team, your, your um, own, you will own that. So there's no tech transfer required um, and it also allows companies to really get up and running quickly. So as companies can just kind of, uh, we can customize the space within like a month. Um, it's because we actually are more of an engineering company. Um, we have uh, invested a lot ourselves into the infrastructure so that we can uh, change a tissue culture space to a chemistry hood. So we can change a 10 person lab to a 50 person lab. And all this can be done without interfering with the neighboring group. So we do have some uh, shared resources. We have uh, standardized services, that uh, centralized services that are standardized across all of our sites. And we operate at a quality of standard that we think would rival large pharma because the, we, want, we want the companies that are in our program to also be a happy place for their scientists to work. I, one of the things I think um, isn't always uh, top of mind when people are launching their new independent facilities is what is the experience for these scientists? No scientist wants to work in a basement lab anymore without windows. <laughs> if you're going to be there for 12 hours a day, um, you want to motivate them to stay that long, one. So we have food, we have games, we have community, but uh, very much so it's, it's also just a the new, new facilities with uh, high-end equipment, with operations team on site to make your job easier. And so companies can actually just be more focused on their drug development, on their manufacturing processes, on figuring out where fundraising funds are going to come from next rather than dealing with vendors and uh, doing a lot of the day-to-day -day operations themselves. So I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So with, with, in terms of community building, so Eric is going to have this community of, of diagnostics companies, and so they can share best practices. And they can, are, are you building also community in the Smart Labs, the same way that the Center for, for Breakthrough Therapies is doing in gene therapy out in the Prussia? So there's two different examples of community that's going on. How does that work with Smart Lab? So I think the, the, the community aspect is going to be a bit company specific because I think there is a culture that every group wants to develop on their own. And all the spaces within Smart Labs, like all the companies have private spaces. So they very much have that opportunity to make their own independent culture. But we do encourage uh, companies to work together. Um, we have actually talked to groups um, about needing certain pieces of equipment and then help, help, helping them find it actually within um, another group so they'll share it. Um, and so it's more of a collegiality that you might expect from neighboring labs in a research institute. Um, I'm not actually sure what the Center of Breakthrough Medicine does, so I can't uh, actually comment on that, but we do have actual like speaker events, we'll have like lunch and learns, uh, we do happy hours. Um, so the idea is very much just for the people who are working in that space to, uh, again, enjoy showing up to work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we don't um, try to make it so that everyone feels like they need to be best friends with the, every like every company in that in their own space. Some groups really do want a little bit more privacy. They want to be um, a little bit um, 
less sharing of information. And we allow them that opportunity to kind of to say to themselves if they want, but we do encourage groups to so share best practices. Enough programming to create collisions for those that are looking for a, a little bit of a networking activity. Yeah, and then we also uh, encourage groups that if we have sites in Boston and San Francisco and soon we'll be launching in Philadelphia, um, but if groups are actually traveling, we do encourage um, that you're in our program in Boston and you need somewhere to work in, in South San Francisco, you, like, we're part of the, you can be part of that community as well. So, so Eric, that sort of brings me back to, let's just uh, ground this a little bit as well, is in, in the question about what an incubator is and does, and that some of those services are kind of non-standard, there's not a one-size-fits-all, but what are the, would you say there are major hallmarks to an incubator, or? Yeah, I think the major hallmarks are that there aren't any. <laughs> I, I think that's one of those eight words that are out there that mean different things at different times, different circumstances. Um, you know, there's accelerators too, which are a different creature. I think that what, at least to my mind, for the, specifically for laboratories, and again, I'm specifically thinking about probably even earlier stage than the days that you've done. These are the people that are still maybe in an academic laboratory, you know, that they, they need to get out of and make their first moves, or you know, maybe they acquired some IP and they need to get in and get their hands dirty with it. Um, and typically there's two things. There's the laboratory space itself, and then there's offered amenities, is what the real estate folks have told me these are called. And I think that's, you know, you can sell a long list of amenities, but then you should ask yourself, what do you actually need? And I think that actually is something that one would need to do if you were considering something like an incubator is you, you would really want to go in and take a look, of course, at the physical space and make sure it meets your needs. You know, just because they have the hood doesn't mean that it's a biosafety cabinet, for example. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if they say they have gases, what does that mean? Just an ice machine. You know, take a look at it and, you know, if they say, well, we've got an NMR you know, back there for you to use, that may sound great to a scientist until they realize that I'm never going to need an NMR, so that's nice, but that's not going to attract me. So I think it's a combination of what is the laboratory, what the amenities are, and the amenities have two types. They're physical amenities, you know, they would be the shared public spaces, they would be the shared technical resources available, and then there's the softer stuff, which, you know, at least to my mind, in a community of interest, which is maybe what I would call what I would like to see us do, you would have a means by which people, for example, who think that they know what a CLIA lab is, find out what a CLIA lab actually is, for instance. So those softer things. I mean, everybody knows, and I'm talking diagnostics. I mean, mostly when you think life sciences and this area, of course, you're thinking drugs or therapies or therapeutics, but I'm here to represent the it's the stepchild of all of that, you know, the, the, the three and a half percent of the healthcare spend is that. But you know, if you're also going to be developing a, a you know a therapeutic, you may think you need laboratory facilities of a certain type. Like, I think you need to take a look. Now, I do think that the privacy part is important. I, I don't know that most people really want to be in a bench next to somebody you know they don't know at all working on a different project. For any number of reasons, like I don't want your stuff to crap up what's on my bench, you know. <laughs> I don't want to amplify whatever it is you got, you know, over there. So I think that, um, you know, what we would like to see, and, and there are examples of that regionally, you know, I, I will openly say that I'm a big fan of what way out even further in the suburbs than we are in Doylestown, I think they've done a great job at the PA Biotech Center. I think that's, that's mostly a, you know, a therapeutics play, but I think they have done many things right, and um, that's what I'm mostly familiar with from other interactions I've had. Um, I think the soft support is quite important, especially to the very early stage person, in particular if they're coming not from industry but from academia, uh, and that's what I would say you would want to include in what it is that you're checking out when you consider your spaces. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, deviate just for a second to ask you about that soft support and get perspectives from all three of you. Art, let me start this with you. When you're building a company, how important are some of the extras that might come from some incubators and accelerators in particular, but where you're getting potential mentors that have industry experience in the work area you're going into? Um, 
potential angel groups coming around and, and sniffing and kicking tires with you? And how important are those sort of soft services that Eric's talking about? I think they're very important. Um, I think that uh, they're ex they are, by definition, the, the extension of community. You're, uh, you're going to attract um, other stakeholders. As you say, it, the, the first order of business at every company is to be able to attract investors. Um, others interested in what you're doing. Uh, uh, that comes with your proof of principle, proof of concept studies, um, and you do that as quickly as you possibly can and, um, and start engaging with investors. And you never know um, where investors are going to come from, but very often they're attracted to you know, innovation hubs, um, sh shared lab space, that they know that this is where the good ideas yeah. are coming from. Daisy, do you have a view? Do you have pitch days? I do have a view, um, <laughs> not necessarily a pitch. Um, I think that what's, what's important to understand is I think that the term incubator at the most basic uh, level is lab space cheap for companies. Um, and it's actually one of the reasons we actually don't use the term incubator to describe ourselves because um, while you, people do need access to cheap lab space to get things started, there are drawbacks to being in a facility. Um, maybe the amenities aren't exactly what you need them to be, um, or it is just an issue of crowding or getting the right equipment in place. But when it comes to what those software amenities uh, are, so if you need HR help, legal help, uh, introduction to investors, that I think that the fact that there are incubators makes it easier. So having uh, a place where the BD teams of Name Your Pharma knows they can just go to a networking event and get to meet people, that's incredibly important. I think that that's valuable. And also being introduced to the investors of your neighbors, uh, like that I think is incredibly value, valuable. Um, but I think it also depends on what the company's needs are. Not every group requires that help. Maybe they have a good seed state, like a seed fund, and their uh, VC backers or board members are providing a lot of this guidance, uh, they're providing these reductions, and it's just extra that the uh, value is, uh, extra value that's being added. But it, I think it, uh, for companies that are just starting out, a lot of those services are really important, but as companies mature and they have those in place, they don't necessarily benefit from them long term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Eric, do you have a view of this, the, like keeping a mentor network in orbit around a bunch of startups is hard. It's I think, I think Daisy's right that, you know, again, I'm thinking about sort of the lost soul who's got a great idea and maybe they've got some, you know, friends and family money, some angel money. Um, I do think that uh, the flexibility, by the way, in the space is important that, you know, certainly it's something I think about in what we're trying to do. But I think in terms of the, um, the basic soft knowledge, if you will, and conveying that I think is quite important because you know ultimately when you're speaking to an investor you do have to come off knowing what you're talking about as they bring in their own experts to evaluate you your viability your seriousness and they know that you're not going to know everything of course right I mean you, how can you I mean I realize we, we were talking earlier and Art was describing basically having every job on the you know <laughs> title in the in impacts when he got started with it. And I think I know how that goes. So I do think it's, it's valuable. I don't think it's critical. And when you say cheap lab space, I, I will say I believe that in particular the space that we have in mind is quite affordable. I don't like to say cheap because it is, you know, a, a, it, it's very high quality laboratory space right. as a matter of fact. Uh, and I think the amenities around it are important because people are working there and those their physical comfort. I mean, I don't know that we're going to have foosball tables or something when, with what we're doing, but I do think that people need to feel the dignity of their workspace as well. Yeah. And that's something that, and the idea, I, I did want to respond to the individual cultures. You know, companies aren't born with culture, by the way. Right. And, and societies and communities can be made up of people of multiple cultures, but community is still very important in that context. And you can build a community of interest around people with different viewpoints, right? I mean, we'd like to think that here in Philadelphia, for example. Uh, so I, I do think that that soft aspect of trying to actively construct it is an important attribute of an incubator that's doing its job. 
So there's a, a conventional number that venture capitalists like to use that if you're in some of the bigger spaces in therapeutics, sorry, Eric, uh, either oncology or cardiovascular, that the full cost of getting you to market from the beginning is going to be $500 million. And there is nothing you can do to escape that. That is the cost of delivering a program all the way through. So venture capitalists look at that when they're hearing your pitch as a startup, and they've got that in the back of their minds. Is, this, is the management team going to deliver? Is the platform earth changing? Now, obviously, we all hope cell therapy might change those dynamics and those averages. But when you think about the burn rate of those early stages, uh, let me maybe Art start with you on this. What were some of the things you wished you'd had access to, maybe to speed up the process that you didn't have to, shouldn't have had to pay for at the beginning, as an independent company that you might have done as a shared resource that would have saved your burn rate, saved you, you know, capital efficiency that your investors would have loved, and saved you time and energy. Lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> How many lawyers? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Uh, we, we burned through a lot of lawyers' fees. Um, they were great, but um, uh, what would we have wished we had? Um, hard to imagine. I think that um, we were lucky in that uh, a lot of the momentum of the company and a lot of the proof of concept was already teased out, if you will, at uh, Jefferson. Uh, before the IP was transferred out. We were able to hit the ground running. Uh, the timing was very good for, uh, with investors and their appetites and vision of a, a fairly new field at the time we started immunotherapy. So um, would, if there was one thing, I, if we could have moved a little faster with our buildup of uh, build out of our offices and and laboratory space. Um, that that was key. So that plays right into the thesis here. Um, the, the faster you can get out and set up your independent lab, the better. Uh, Daisy, is it a truism to say that all of the companies that come to work with you are preclinical, or not all? No, not all. Um, some companies that are in our program we just want to access the talent in the geographies that we're in. So they may have a company based in Europe, um, in Asia, in Canada, different part of the U.S., and are looking to access the cell and gene therapy talent of, of Philadelphia or the manufacturing uh, skill set of medical antibodies you might find in groups in California. Uh, so depend th there is some biases in terms of where people think they can get certain types of talent, whether that's management, manufacturing, or re research in specific areas, that they may uh, choose to launch a team. So it's not all preclinical startups, but we also have uh, larger organizations like Mitsubishi and Tanabe actually has an innovation group in our uh, location in Boston. And are they using that as a, as a beachhead, or are they specifically working with the companies that are on, in that site? It's a, like a BD kind of project okay. for them. So they have some uh, collaborations with some uh, ho hospitals in the area, and it allows them to kind of create new IP in an uh, area that's not owned by that hospital. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges, honestly, is if you actually do a discovery at an academic lab, the academic yeah. lab kind of owns it. And so, There's a, a business reason to want that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Eric, it's obviously, it can be a lot quicker to get a diagnostic to the market and deliver than a, than a therapy on average. Uh, so does that change the, the focus that you have on what kinds of shared resources to create in an incubation setting? Well, first of all, the, you know, the scale is different. It doesn't cost $500 million right. to get a diagnostic, but it's not cheap either. You know. 50 to 100 million dollars is often what it ends up costing to get a diagnostic. And, and by the way, there's right there's the diagnostic product and there's the diagnostic technology. And a lot of the growth today is on the technology side, right? Point of care, et cetera, those kinds of things. Um, I think that you know, for for one thing, again, what do you want? It's, diagnostics is kind of complicated because you may need to have access to all sorts of odd vendors, right, for example. 
So if you're on your own and you're trying to figure out where did I get my lyophilized beads from, you know, because these guys aren't doing it for me anymore. I mean, that is a specific experience, you know, I had. Or, you know, who's a good molder? Those kinds of things. If you if you're by yourself someplace and yep. you know maybe not in somebody's basement, but you know isolated, you'll have to figure that out for yourself. And it's time that you don't really want to be spending on stuff like that. So I think that, you know, getting again in a community of people that are kind of in your same general area, they're not going to generally mind talking to you about things like that. Uh, another thing is, you know, a wet lab. If you need it now, you need it now. If you have to go looking for it or somebody says, I'll, I'll get it to you, you know, when I can, is very frustrating. Um, again, our experience in California, we had to build our own wet lab because we were already there. The engineering lab, did, you know, that, that was just an office space. But once you started really needing a wet lab and expanding it, it, it took time and money and it was irritating. You know, we didn't, as I said, we were, <laughs> you know, it was cheap space, but we had to build what we needed to build. I, I think that, um, again, for the very early stage diagnostics company, you know, you're usually looking for a few million dollars to get to proof of concept, not a few tens of million dollars. But the other thing that, you know, there's the joke that the, you know, the longest four-letter word in the English language for investors was in vitro diagnostics, right? Yeah. But, you know, so people... You, you have to be able to persuade somebody if they're going to give you money that you will spend it very efficiently because you're not going to get a lot of money from them in the first place. It's not like a drug. Nobody says they're going to develop a drug and then ask you for a hundred thousand bucks. You know, but you can do something with that in diagnostics as long as you're not taking a salary. Yeah, I, I want to add to that. Um, I think what, it, what you were saying, it takes a long time to actually build a lab, but it actually also takes a good amount of time to set it up to yep. hire the people, to get the equipment in place, to get the permits, to make sure that you have your uh, contracts in place with your lab co-providers, with your chemical uh, waste disposal groups, uh, your janitorial security services. There's a lot that goes into running an independent space. Yep. And you can, ha have, you can do that all yourself. It will take time and you will, you will not have a lean team. It, and once you accept your first tranche of investment, you're on the clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's go back to that sort of hypothetical that we talked about at the beginning of a, a true seed stage, start, stage startup. But bring it forward a little bit. Let's say you're at a startup, you've raised 10 million, uh, you're leaping out of your first uh, you know, garage. <laughs> you're gonna go into something that has some infrastructure and get some support. What are the kinds of things that you should be looking for in that space? So How do you know it's right for you? Yeah, I, one thing that um, is sort of a, supposedly a truism, and I suspect it is still a truism, is if you move more than five miles from where you are, you start losing people. So if you've built a team someplace, including in an incubator, you should be thinking about where you're going to go next. If you think, well, I'm, I'm here in Philadelphia, but I really want to be in L.A. later on, and you've got some, you know, brain power in your organization. You're nuts, right? In fact, even if you want to move to Princeton, you might be crazy. So I do, th I mean, it's a, since it's real estate, right, you should think about location. Where would I go from here to scale up? Um, you know, incubators aren't designed for scale up, certainly the ones I'm aware of are not. Um, but I do think, I think we all hope, all of us here from Philadelphia hope that with the increasing amount of, in particular, laboratory space being developed, that you won't have to leave the area to find your next spot, uh, I don't think. Suppose I've been told there's now a glut. I don't believe it quite, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I do think that that is an important aspect because of the importance. The team is the most important thing for the startup. It's not the lab, the technology. If you don't have it in the first place, you know, nobody's going to give you money. So it's that team. You don't have traction because you're not commercial, right? So it's the team. And if you build a team and then you move and you lose the team, you know. That's probably the worst use of the investor money you could possibly make. So go where you need to be in order to get to the point where you can make a move that makes sense. And if you have to lose the team in the process, make sure you know that that's okay. And that may be okay, right? You may get to the point where you solve the problems for the people you need, as awful as it sounds. And now I need people that know how to do manufacturing. You know, sorry. Right. But I think that's an important part of it. Art, what's your sense of what you should be looking for at that stage? I think uh, it's location, location for the sake of hiring, actually. Um, and uh, can, uh, attracting, um, you're building a team, 
and um, typically you're you're adding. And um, we looked at um, we started in West Philadelphia. We looked at the Navy Yard, and I frankly loved the Na Navy Yard, but I couldn't see how it was going to be easy for employees to get down there. Um, hope I'm not offending anybody mm -hmm. from the Navy Yard here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we ended up right down the street here in a 120-year-old building that was is historic and was the center of innovation really in the 19 early uh, well late 1800s and um, is now become a, a bit of a biotech hub um, so we thought the public transportation was convenient the kind of employees that we were, would like to attract probably live in Philadelphia as opposed to the exurbs or suburbs. So um, that was a big factor with us. Interesting. Daisy? I think it's actually really important to realize what do you need and do you have the people on your team who are supposed to make that decision? Uh, I've worked with a bunch of groups that have not hired their head of research yet. And when that person comes on, R&D strategy is gonna shift completely. Um, and so maybe what they were originally designing for their own private build out needs to make some changes. And so those changes cost money. Uh, so that uh, I think every build out ends up costing like at least 10% more than what was predicted, um, if not even more than that. Um, Where's my research guy? Uh, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then also when you are going into a space, um, so do you need tissue culture space, BSL2 lab space, animal research space, chemical space? Um, and is that building that you're going capable of providing you that infrastructure? If you're going to be doing a lot of small molecule work, a lot of oligosynthesizing, then you probably need a good number of fume hoods. Can you add anything to the roof? Can you access um, additional uh, like storage space elsewhere? Um, is the plumbing system capable of handling the waste stream you're gonna be developing? And I feel like uh, there are groups who are focused so much on like, well, this is, I just need space for 10 to 15 people, and here's a spec lab, let's just sign that lease for four or five years. And they don't realize until after the fact that, oh, I need to do a lot of work to make it fit the research that I need to do. Yeah, Eric, please. So I'll be a little bit of a suck up, I suppose, for, for you and the others mm -hmm. in your industry, but I do think that when you talk about space and location, you know, there's a lot of expertise in the real estate industry amongst the brokers who in this area are, you know, representing various opportunities. And, you know, my experience has been that they know an awful lot that a, a startup might not know. And also, you know, the design build firms that do the renovations, there's a few that do a lot of life science work. I mean, you know, I have a good relationship with the one that we use. And um, I think that, you know, those, again, those are the kinds of people that you might meet coming into an incubator because, you know, they'll be floating around hoping for that opportunity that when they graduate, they'll say, oh, I, I know you, you know, go find me a space or go build me something. So yeah. I, I do think that, you know, let's not forget the non-technical, if you will, part of the equation. I think that's something worth keeping in mind. Brokers in this industry are, um the good ones are very sophisticated and understand the needs of a wet lab, understand your regulatory path and your uh, clinical development and help you. Um, in our case, that was a huge factor. Yeah, for most companies, when they're looking to commit to a space, they're only going to do it one to four times in a single company's lifetime, whereas the brokers have, are doing dozens of deals every year. Yeah. I will say some of them have the the, the utmost mastery of trivia. <laughs> so yesterday we were having a conversation about the history of the height limits that were unofficial in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman won a bottle of wine from me for knowing the height of William Penn. What was it, Anthony? He's from Philadelphia. <laughs> Amazing. Did you look it up or did you just believe He him? totally cheated. Mason Absolutely Mason cheated. Building did you, did in you the check world, right? your Google? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I toured it. <laughs> See? But you needed to know even that it was Billy Penn in the first place. That's, that's the true feeling. <laughs> because I remember when they blew past that. You know. Eric, uh, could you do a, a little more of a commercial on the Center for uh, Diagnostic Discovery? Tell us a little bit more about what the sort of inspiration was and what you're doing.
sure. So the inspiration was a whole lot of empty space that we ended up with when Elisa uh, decided that it was time to move unexpectedly. But um, so as I mentioned, my background, you know, business background, if you will, and uh, otherwise is, is more in the diagnostics end. But uh, so we had a space that I felt could be converted into a laboratory space using you know, models of incubators that have been successful. So the, the space consists of private laboratory suites that you know, are leased in a membership model. It's not really a lease. It's, you know, you, you're a member of the, of the center. We do have an anchor tenant already. We have an affiliated nonprofit with a couple of core labs, a genetics lab and a mass spec lab. So it won't, to the first person in, it won't feel like you know, we're in a big hall by ourselves. There are you know, sh the kinds of shared spaces I think that incubators typically offer, break spaces, meeting rooms, et cetera, you know, the basic kinds of support that you know, anybody needs, security, you know, the various facilities, uh, needs that you have if you're going to have a laboratory, biohazard, chemical, et cetera, uh, provision of the sorts of things that actually startups don't often easily do on their own, just what are the SOPs that we really need to have for that kind of thing. We do have, the, the, I mean, the, we're not open yet, so I, this is all theoretical, but hopefully not too theoretical. So, you know, beginning next year, there would be the kinds of programs I alluded to that would be preferably focused more around the needs of those in a laboratory that are pursuing some aspect of diagnostics, so the kinds of things that I mentioned earlier, such as, you know, what is a CLIA lab, what are the regulatory issues in diagnostics that are different from what you might expect in, uh, in therapeutics. Um, are you providing any of that guidance? Me, us personally, mm -hmm. we have people that can do that. For instance, I mean, our business, which is a diagnostics reference laboratory, I will use our QA department to support that, for example. So we have you know, lab directors that can come over and speak to that. IP, I mean, that I think anybody will offer that there's access to IP attorneys to help people to think about that. And they'll come in and talk. And those you know, financial folks that want to talk, you know, we expect them to come in as well as has been offered. I've found, by the way, that uh, you know, the sponsor of this program, uh, BioStrategy Partners, is a great, for me, it's, per, it's a perfect interface between the targets and you know, for whom we would like to attract, because these are people that are looking for help, you know, how to get started. Um, so the, you know, the idea, and I you know, frankly got egged on by the design, the, the, the fellow uh, Tim Kelly at the design build firm that we use, who's been you know, championing this idea. We both like the idea. We have um, you know, an interest in seeing very early stage businesses take root here in metropolitan Philadelphia and stay here. They're not going to stay in spaces that I own, which is fine by me, but I'll be very happy to see some groups able to thrive in a space that doesn't have a, you know, a sexy reputation. I mean, you know, diagnostics is, is tough. It's, in some ways, it's more complicated than drugs, as a matter of fact. They're more, if you will, they're more interfaces. <laughs> you know, wherever there's an interface, there's a problem. So, um, yeah, uh, it'll have BSL-2 laboratory suites ranging from 500 to 1,500 square feet. Uh, they will be private, secured, and available 24-7, and all the kinds of things Daisy started talking about, you know, gases, uh, you know, DI water, you know, the, the amenities that I referred to that are most relevant for what we are offering. Um, so, you know, I, and it's in Horsham, okay? I mean, we have parking, <laughs> plenty of that. Uh, it's, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's, uh, there's, it's not beautiful space like you would have in Center City, Philadelphia, where you can walk out. I grant that, but I think there's room for uh, we're not a huge operation, and there are people, for instance, in the suburbs who don't want to commute to the city and sure. will be perfectly happy to you know, not have to go down 95 or the Blue Route to get to work. So, I, I mean, you don't really sell on that basis, although people will come on that basis in the well, first sure. place. We are in a, thank you, that I knew I loved you guys. Uh, we are in a kids zone, which we have other benefits, I would say. And the township is very eager to see people coming in. 
I have to say that. Um, yes? To that extent that you're talking about the regulatory environment, is Philadelphia a welcoming place? Is there, are there hurdles in place for you? Um, or is it just a matter of federal law that you're following? But does, does the city of Philadelphia encourage uh, creating space like this? I think Philadelphia is fantastic. Yeah, I think they're a, a model of um, cooperation and help. That, that's been my experience. Um, Philadelphia is wide open. And, and of course, this is the fastest growing industry in this city and the region. So they have good reason to be uh, supportive. And they have a whole staff of people in the Commerce Department that will reach out and, and help you in any way. The regulatory obstacles are not local. Yeah. So and, could you, and they Mayor, don't, tell, and they tell don't. people what, a, what CLIA is? It's a, so, it's a specialty in the business. So there is one interesting thing. So everybody knows who the FDA is, right? They're the guys you have to convince that your drug is safe and effective and all that. So CLIA is a different federal law. It's the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act. And anybody who is testing patient samples must have a license to do so under a federal law, CLIA, which is administered by the state. So the state of Pennsylvania Department of Health issues licenses for that. And there are requirements that are really quite different than the ones that you have when you think about a GLP environment, you know, which is required by the FDA for any work done for preclinical uh, testing, for example. So the, the regulatory world around CLIA is a licensure and for the very early stage diagnostics company who's not actually testing patients yet wouldn't need a CLIA license but as soon if they thought that their laboratory was going to be their product that they were going to set up a new lab with a cool new diagnostic or suite of diagnostics and flog them somehow there's a couple of things that you need you need that license but then you need a way to distribute that test and uh, that is actually something that I've thought about in conjunction with this uh, laboratory uh, uh, incubator because if you have a relationship with a lab that already has that ability to distribute them, that is a CLIA lab, you can do so. And then I have to mention, because it's uh, very annoying to the FDA, but there's been a big fight about what are called lab developed tests, LDTs, that actually is really important for the diagnostic space. So it turns out that as things stand today, even though there was some laws that were being considered by Congress, uh, a different organization than the FDA has most of the say about what diagnostic tests can be performed for patients. And that is CMS, you know, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And they are CLIA. If you're CLIA, you're good. The point is, is that you don't need, in theory, to go through a 510K if you're a lab with an LDT. What you can't do is manufacture a product that doesn't clear the FDA and sell it to labs that are going to put them uh, for diagnostics. So it's a weird wrinkle. It's like a loophole. It's a, it, well, you know, it is, and there's a big stink about it. The uh, large diagnostics companies, you know, the Roches of the world, feel it's unfair. I don't think they're really doing very badly, you mm -hmm. know, with this law in place. <laughs> so I don't, wouldn't worry about it. But it's an interesting wrinkle in the regulatory space and that, you know, in, in this niche area of diagnostics is the kind of thing that we can speak to that I think a typical uh, you know, incubator wouldn't really know much about. So it's, again, it, I grant that it's niche, but if, if you're in diagnostics, you may want to be in a place where other people who understand these things or are thinking and wrestling with them are. And I'll just throw one other little yeah. regulatory thing out there because I just learned about it and I was floored to find out that USDA has its own regulatory regimen around for diagnostics animals. for veterinary and agricultural purposes. And, you know, who knew? I didn't know, <laughs> to be honest. I never ran into it before. Okay, Pardon me? You've been in the industry a long time. <laughs> Pardon me? You've been in the industry for a while. <laughs> we, well, never with animals. Yeah. Uh, I mean, other than, you know, preclinical work, animal studies, that's FDA. But, yeah. you know, chickens, that's USDA. So uh, it's interesting how in different parts of the industry, the question comes back to talent in a lot of ways. CLIA is another example where there's a particular profession, just like in manufacturing, manufacturing technician is the key to growing that, that sort of asset type, if 
we're going to use real estate terms. In CLIA, you have to have, there's a licensed person called a clinical laboratory scientist, CLS. Does Jefferson have a CLS program? I don't know if it does. Uh, they have lab directors. Yeah, sure it's a lab do. director. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they got lots of them. <laughs> and so CLS is typically most state agencies that are covering health will register all the CLSs. You'll actually know exactly how many CLSs there are state by state. But it's a great example of one of the bottlenecks that the industry feels with some frequency is that job category. It takes a while to train. Um, we're, we live in interesting times. Oh, there's a question here. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, would you advise a company in a suburban area to move to Philadelphia market I mean, is there compelling evidence in the diagnosis? I, I'm sorry, I, could, I'm, I couldn't quite is hear you. Is there compelling evidence for a suburban startup to move to Philadelphia that's, for that's space? Is there compelling evidence for that? It's got or the money. It, it, <laughs> uh, well, so the suburbs are cheaper, but they are, let's face it, if you're in University City, you know, you're in the middle of an academic center of, you know, probably incomparable, really, or you know, you can't do better. Uh, but I think the suburbs have certain things worth considering. I think affordability is something that is very important, again, for the early stage company. Um, you know, we're not, you know, near us, there's Springhouse Innovation Park, there's, you know, Discovery Labs out in King of Prussia now. I mean, there are suburban things happening, and I, I think that for some people, the suburbs are more comfortable. I, you know, I do think that, you know, Art made a good point that for a lot of people, there's an attraction to an urban area. You know, all my kids moved into the city. They didn't stay in the suburbs, you know. So, you know, young people, many of whom are your scientists that you're going to want to have, sure. may prefer it. Uh, I will point out that many times people that start young families start to think about whether they like the city so much because of what they may or may not think about the school systems and whatnot. That's how the suburbs usually roll, right? They say, well, we've got a better quality of life for families or whatever they, they say. But it's, I guess that's not really what I'm supposed to be talking about here, but that's, <laughs> that's my opinion. I don't want to put words in Art's mouth, but I will say that for access to the cell and gene therapy employees, there's a lot of coming out, right out, right out of the university. Right. The, the yep, it's, it's, a, it's just a funnel. It's, it's very useful. And, and, and but Eric's right too. It's it just sort of depends on where you are in the in your your expansion. Yeah. And I can talk a little bit about what we've seen in the Boston area because you do see many companies just starting off in Kendall Square, Central Square, downtown Boston because they want to um, access talent and they feel like these locations are more attractive to these younger uh, scientists. But a large fraction of these companies end up, okay, we've now our series B and we want to scale to 50 to 100 people. That's usually when they start actually thinking about the suburb because they will have enough mass in their own team where they feel like they can take that culture with them. Um, and they're not necessarily displacing everything. Um, and they'll, they actually do a uh, calculation. I know brokers will actually think about their employees on the payroll right now, where, what's mm -hmm. the commute going to be like? And this is where you actually need to take advantage of the resources you have from the brokers and recruiters. Talk to them, find out the, the, uh, the kind of people that you want to bring on your team. Where do you find them? Um, is this something that you can target specific people in your geography? Maybe you don't have to move to the suburbs. It really depends on what you want to do next. We can do all that. Art, mm -hmm. Matt, can I uh, ask Daisy a question? <laughs> um, Daisy, you're from um, Massachusetts where all things biotech have been happening for the last 15, 20 years. What attracted you to Philadelphia, and what do Bostonians think of all the things that are going on here in Philadelphia from a biotech standpoint? Okay, this is being rec recorded, so it'll be nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that uh, I think a lot okay. of Bostonians think about Boston. Boston. Yeah, I, I feel that they Shocking. may consider <laughs> having another site in California. There's, uh, there's talk about putting manufacturing in other locations. But uh, yeah, I do feel like the people in Boston want to stay there. They, there is this in-group kind of mentality there. And so you often see people recruiting from each other. You see management teams kind of moving like two or four of them as a team to a new company. Um, uh, and so that's, um, and then what attracted us to Philadelphia, 
um, was honestly the investment in the cell gene therapy space, the uh, new technologies in mRNA that are also coming out of Penn and the neighboring institutions. Uh, we think the quality of the science is really strong. We think that the startup uh, energy is like still boiling up. I th we still think it's, it's developing. And we're, the reason that we're coming here is because we do feel like there's this valley of death is coming back. Uh, for the longest time, we had companies were able to get money so they could kind of just get past that point, get enough money so they can uh, get to, again, proof of concept, whatever evidence they need for that partnership, for that fundraising. But with things slowing down now, I think that uh, solutions like what we are providing are going to be really critical to help these early stage companies extend their runway, survive a little bit, one or two years longer, and that'll be enough for them to make it through. We'll start hearing capital efficiency again. Yeah. We, so we've got a couple minutes later. I'm going to ask one last question just to get a sort of a parting thought from our, our crew. The world has changed. Uh, COVID caused a lot of people to rethink how they work and why they work. So in, in your cases, if you're looking at what people are going to work for, what do you think has changed about working in a biotech environment? Do I have to go first? Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I think the bigger change is simply the sort of the next generation, honestly. I mean, you know, the, the millennials that we all like to talk about, or Gen Z, I can't keep track of what, I don't know whether I have Gen Z kids or millennial kids. Or <laughs> but, but, I, but I think they're, I, 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 as I said earlier, I think the fact that we've gotten accustomed to virtual, we didn't talk so much about that, I, you know, I think that uh, just now, I, we've, we've gotten comfortable with it. You know, we, yeah. we can make that work. So certainly having everybody in the building is not as important as it has been in terms of comfort. I personally believe that humans still need to be in the building together to truly build you know, a, a sense of being, you know, uh, belonging to a, a culture, if you will. But I also, you know, it, I don't think it's a joke when we say, you know, millennials have a very different attitude with work-life balance, right? I mean, that may change as, you know, many of them are now actually buying houses and having families. But these are the scientists that are going to have the ideas, or if not the ideas, are going to enable the ideas to become something. So I think paying attention to that's probably more important than thinking about, I mean, COVID messed us up badly, right? Mm -hmm. right. I think we're still psychically damaged from it. But I think the bigger trend truly is a generational trend. And I, it feels different to me than, you know, I, I think I'm more like my parents than my kids are like me, if that makes sense, in terms of their, the way they think about things. And they're not lazy, they're not, you know, uninterested, but they, you know, they, they want things that, are a bit different. Is it Geico that does those commercials about you becoming your parents? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it cannot be stopped. Yeah, progressive. Art? <laughs> um, I think that COVID's uh, changed the balance between uh, lab research space and office space, actually. Mm -hmm. So you need less uh, office space, and which is a good, good thing. Um, I know that we're using much less of the office space, but we also have a, a cell processing center which needs to be centralized and fully staffed and on and on. And we have a lab that you can't do research at home. Right. Yeah, um, I gotta say, it, what's interesting about Smart Labs is that we provided space for dozens of companies and then all of a sudden there was People were shutting down. They didn't know if they could come to work. They didn't know if it was safe for them to actually be in that space with other people. And so I think that one, one of the things that we're really proud of is that we never shut down a single day during COVID. Companies were able to access the space. Uh, and we work with every single group to have actually come up with a custom uh, space solution for them. So whether that was kind of bringing up dividers between the, uh, the benches or helping them develop a schedule for people to come in, um, I think that um, how, allowing these companies kind of develop their own solution, um, to, like, which met whatever requirements they had. So if they needed more people in the lab, we figured out how to make that work. If they really were in a point where they can just like write some papers and do some analysis, great, they were even happier. But I think that as things were, are coming back online and things are opening up, we are definitely seeing companies having where their scientists are in the lab for maybe four to six hours a day, and then they might actually still go home to do some of the analysis because commuting time, they don't want to be leaving during rush hour, they want to pick up their kids from school. 
you'll have management teams who are only coming to the office like two to four days a week because they're meeting investors or out uh, on uh, conferences. But I think it is really important to still have some t uh, time together as a team. So we have seen some of our uh, groups kind of just doing more um, off-sites maybe once <coughs> or twice a year to kind of make sure that everyone's aligned. Uh, because I definitely agree that you need to have the in-person um, conversations to actually get ideas um, off the ground and operationalize uh, like new concepts, change, anything involving change really needs to have everybody bought in. And so I think that you are you're seeing this hybrid uh, thing, I think going, I don't think that's gonna go away anytime soon. So having to compensate for that a little bit with that less face-to-face -face time I think is uh, has also been important. That, so, yes? Sure, it's, it's your show. <laughs> You can pick us out. <laughs> tying into the COVID question, I'm curious if we've seen all the couple lights. <laughs> I'm curious if we've seen um, changes in, you know, interest in diagnostics, with how fast diagnostics were getting to market during COVID, and how much relevance they had to COVID. Great. and safe traveling yeah. during COVID, and also infectious disease sector investment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but my theory has been that in 2019, most people did not know what a diagnostic was. Maybe they thought a pregnancy test was a diagnostic or something. I think we all talked about testing, testing, testing for three yep. years. So I do think that, you know, there's an awareness of it, whether that translates. I. I'm not smart enough to know whether the smart money will think that that means more money should be invested in it. Um, but I do think that there's, I mean, there were a thousand companies that were trying to get money out of BARDA for some kind of COVID diagnostic, literally a thousand companies. So they're out there. Um, I, and I have to agree, I, I, I do want to you know, agree with Art. I do think that the lab office balance I, I just wanted to chime in on that. I don't think, we have dozens of empty offices in our company now because people just don't come in anymore. Yeah. But yes, I do think there's been a big change. Um, I think that we'll see whether it turns into greater investor enthusiasm into novel diagnostics and whether people can translate you know, the fact that COVID is this evolving thing that we're gonna have to keep tracking with new and new tests into What's a biomarker good for? What else should we right. be looking for? What about flu? You know, maybe I need to know which of these terrible things I have when I start coughing. You know, is it going to kill me or is it just you know going to put me to bed for a couple of days? So I, I, I think so. I think we are an information-starved society, right? We want to know what's wrong with ourselves, and we want to know quickly, and that's what diagnostics are good for. And then they want a therapeutic to fix it. Right. So that's the rest of it. I personally want to thank BioStrategy Partners for getting this all together this evening. Would you please join me in thanking our panel for sharing their experiences? And I, I think we still have just a few more minutes before the lights go all the way down. Thanks a lot. Feel free to find one of us and ask. We love to coordinate with anybody that's in the industry or a funder or an academic institution to try to help uh, you coordinate with us to bring our innovations to the